Well, first, I'm going to talk specifically about Thomas Jefferson. And I'm going to cover Jefferson in the news during his lifetime. And then I'm also going to talk about Thomas Jefferson in the news today. And so first, one of the most famous news articles about Thomas Jefferson concerned a possible um, relationship, um, as it was called at the time, between Jefferson and one of the enslaved women at Monticello, Sally Hemings. And so this is an article that historians believe first named Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. I mean, typically the protocol in newspapers was just to use people's initials. So this newspaper article was somewhat unusual in specifically identifying Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And so you see here, you have an image of the article itself uh, naming Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And then a little bit of background on the author, James Thompson Callender. He was known a little bit as a scandal monger because he had also in print revealed um, Hamilton's affair, um, which, which of course has been um, made infamous in, um, in Hamilton, the musical. Uh, but so Callender was a scandal monger, political writer. He initially wrote for Democratic papers, and so Thomas Jefferson was an ally of him, and he uh, Je Jefferson also donated and um, um, gave him money through the years and supported his actions in his published attacks of Federalists. Dem uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course, was a Democrat, and his political opponents were Federalists, and Thomas Jefferson was a strong supporter of Callender. However, after Callender was convicted for tax on Federalists under the Alien and Sedition Act, Jefferson withdrew his support and Callender, who had been hoping to receive a patronage position, didn't receive it. Uh, some people speculate that he became a little bit bitter towards Jefferson. And subsequently, while he was working for a Federalist paper, the Richmond Recorder, Callender published a series of attacks on Jefferson alleging a relationship with his enslaved, uh, the enslaved woman on his plantation, Sally Hemings. Um, so what would you all want your students um, to recognize or to, to, to identify in terms of this primary source and ways in which it might be biased or might not be reliable? What would you want them to consider as they're reading this primary source, as they're engaging with this piece of historical news? One for sure that there was a previous relationship between the writer and then you know Thomas that's one one aspect right so they weren't strangers there's some kind of personal relationship um and specifically some people argue that it turned into a hostile relationship right that calendar had a, a little bit of a problem with Jefferson uh so one what else What else would you want your students to notice about um, possibly undermining the credibility or reliability of this primary source? I think they, they would need to consider um, just the writing of it, the syntax, tone, diction, and basic structure. Right, and those could give clues perhaps to some of um, the intentions of the author. Uh, Gwen uh, added a comment into the chat. Maybe the reporter had been someone who had also reported on people's personal lives before, right? So take that into account. Uh, maybe one would want to consider whether or not previous scandals that he had uh, reported on had in fact turned out to be true or whether or not they were known to be false, whether or not they were known to be fake news, whether or not this is fake news. Um, and so uh, Christy talked about uh, in the chat appealing to emotion, generally indicating bias, right, and, and revealing something about the intention of the author here. Well, so this, um, in this session, talking about fake news or the potentiality of fake news or evaluating news sources, um, what I thought, what I, what I, what I thought I would do is to share an assignment that I use with students uh, that might be useful for you all in your own classrooms. And so this student activity calls upon students to exercise a couple of skills related to primary sources 
So on the first slide, I had a couple of skills that I, I, um, I ask my students to consider when they're reading any primary source. So considering who created the source, as well as the circumstances of its creation and how these factors shape the content. I ask students to analyze a primary source, specifically looking at the content and embedded perspectives, themes, and messages about the past. So this really connects with Christy's comment from earlier. I also ask students to contextualize a primary source, placing the source in its time and place, and considering how those factors shaped its content, corroborating a source, verifying its accuracy, considering its typicality, whether or not it's reinforced or corroborated by other primary and secondary sources. And then finally, using primary sources to support or defend a historical argument. And so in this exercise, this activity that um, for students, I ask students to source, analyze, contextualize, and corroborate, most especially, a new source with other sources, and then interpret the evidence to support a position. And the main question the, that students consider in this exercise is uh, the relationship between Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson, and specifically whether or not Thomas Jefferson fathered Sally Hemings' children. And so what I would like for you all to do in a breakout session is to explore this student activity. Uh, what I have students do is to, what I do first is to draw a continuum on the board uh, with two endpoints. Jefferson was the father of Hemings' children or Jefferson was not the father of Hemings' children. Uh, and for more advanced students, sometimes I create an extra column for irrelevant evidence. And then I hand out pieces of evidence to students and I ask them to place the pieces of evidence on the continuum. And then once everyone has placed their piece of evidence, I ask them to review the placement of the evidence and we discuss key pieces of evidence and where they're placed, whether or not students think pieces of evidence are misplaced, whether or not they should be moved to the right or to the left. And then after reviewing all of the evidence, we discuss the main historical question, whether or not Jefferson fought Sally Hemings' children. Um, so you'll see on the slides, I have the pieces of evidence, uh, which you can consider in, um, in breakout rooms, but also I have listed a couple of questions that I uh, suggest as possible discussion topics for you all in your breakout rooms, the possible benefits of the activity for your students, the challenges of incorporating this activity into your classroom and how the activity could be modified for your courses. So if you have the PDF, we're going to go ahead and send you all the breakout rooms and you'll all come back in about five minutes and we'll talk about what you all talked about. Well, welcome back everyone from the breakout rooms. Uh, I hope you all had good, quick five minute discussions. What did y'all talk about? Well, in ours, we talked about how this is a good activity that you could use across different levels from middle school through high school and how the fact that you'd have your kids up and moving facilitates discussion and facilitates them wanting to be a part of it, where if you just had them sitting in their chair reading through this on their own, it wouldn't be as, as enticing. So I think the the other moving and, and thinking through it together is enticing for them. I mean, absolutely. It's a real pick me up. If the energy in your classroom starting to flag a little bit, uh, students do get a little bit more uh, perked up in the process of moving about the, just the sort of movement um, during the activity itself. Uh, what other thoughts did you all have in your breakout rooms? We were discussing um, how to use these texts and these ideas that um, in an English class um, and how like, you know, we may not dive as deeply into some of the history of some of these texts because we may not have the same amount of time for that kind of thing. But I do think whether it's an article or the news or a letter or a book that it's important to understand where the author is coming from um, and that kind of context. So that talking about some of these things could be really important, even if you're studying the pieces for their more literary properties rather than news and history. Well, and the activity could also be very easily adapted to include excerpts from the, those primary sources themselves rather than summaries of them, as you see on the slides that I provided. Uh, but I very much liked Kristen's point about considering the authors, the creators of these words. And that was one of the things that uh, I really 
hone in on when I talk about this activity with students. So let's just take a, a look at a couple of the pieces of evidence. Now, where would you have put Thomas Cal or James Callender? Where would you have put his piece of evidence, his um, article alleging an, an, an affair, as he called it, uh, between Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson? Where would you all have put it uh, on this continuum? Well, it would go underneath of if I understood it correctly, it would go underneath the Thomas Jefferson was the baby daddy. <laughs> <laughs> and where would you put it? Would you put it close to the middle or close to the end? Uh, let me see. I'm going to look at it again. Uh, yeah. I would put it closer to the middle because it's hearsay, right? Right, so he doesn't yeah. have personal knowledge. Yeah. What about, there was one piece of evidence from one of Thomas Jefferson's friends. So Calendars was a publicly published piece in a newspaper. Uh, one of Thomas Jefferson's friends and neighbors also referenced uh, a relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Where would you all put that? Closer to the left. Closer to the left. So let me do that. All right, and so this is what I do with students. It's a little bit more fun when they get to get up and walk around and then they tape it onto the wall. But then I, I have them move pieces of evidence around. And sometimes uh, students can't come to consensus. Sometimes students think one piece of evidence should be close the middle or further towards the end, but it, it is a good exercise just to get students talking about um, and showing the ways in which they interpret different, how they, how they read different pieces of evidence in different ways. And that really highlights um, how these types of um, endeavors, looking at history or other humanities can often be really interpretive events, right? That there's not one objectively right answer, that it, there's not one objectively right position to place John Hart Wilcock or James Callender, but that um, different students will weigh different pieces of evidence in different ways. Okay. I think I need to stop annotating maybe. There we go. Oh, well, my annotations are still there. I've never used annotations before, if you've ever noticed this. You can erase them with the eraser I'm or trying you can find, I'm trying to find the erase. Uh, it's in the annotate uh, toolbar. The erase has disappeared. Oh, the eraser. There we go. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So, what do y'all think based on the pieces of evidence that y'all looked at? Uh, and I pulled these pieces of evidence from a report from the uh, Thomas Jefferson Foundation. It, it looked through all of the available evidence. And so the pieces of evidence that I shared on the slides were just a couple. There were, uh, for the full exercise in my class, I use almost all of the pieces of evidence. I pulled out maybe 18 pieces of evidence. And so based on the evidence that you all saw in the slides, uh, what would you all say? Uh, were Calendar's allegations fake news? To what extent did the other evidence corroborate his account? What do y'all think? I would guess that it's real just because of that second source that you mentioned that his neighbor said uh, yes to all that. So this is my, my guess. What's really powerful, I think, about the exercise is once students have placed all of the evidence, most of the evidence is on the side of Thomas Jefferson Father, the children of Sally Hemings. And so they see it visually uh, where the weight of the evidence falls. And that's, I think, another advantage of this exercise, because you might come into the assignment having a particular opinion, a particular bias, shall we say, of whether or not Thomas Jefferson's uh, fathered the children of Sally Hemings. But when you see where you place all of the evidence and that most of the evidence falls on one side, it's a real moment where you were able to sort of check your biases against the, the available evidence. 
Uh, so I think most people, for most people, the, the weight of the evidence falls on that side, that interpretation, um, just because the, the evidence is quite strong. So I want to talk really quickly about news coverage of Thomas Jefferson today, just to make a couple of points. Um, first, I know I don't think students properly distinguish between news articles and opinion pieces when they're looking at the news. Uh, but in either case, both journalists and opinion writers, they're following different standards in their writings than historians would follow. Historians follow specific scholarly standards um, that, that guide how uh, we should assess evidence. Uh, and on the slide, you can see a link to the American Historical Association scholarly standards. This is an example that I often share with my students. And so as a consequence, when you see history covered in the news, it often contains many factual errors and interpretive problems. And I really want students and emphasize want students to know this and I emphasize it to them uh, because sometimes we can um, just uh, uncritically absorb news um, and historical knowledge from news without scrutinizing it. And so I really emphasize the ways in which the news and history in the news must be assessed for bias and reliability. Um, and in particular, what I emphasize, what I want to emphasize today, uh, because I know Megan's going to talk about a lot of um, different ways in which students should encounter media sources. And what I want to specifically emphasize is something a little bit more nuanced and complex, specifically the ways in which words often implicitly support or obscure specific interpretations. So, for example, this headline here conveys a particular interpretation of Thomas Jefferson, the slave who stole the president's heart. It imagines and implies a particular relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Uh, we don't have time for the breakout room, but this is another activity that might be useful for you all in classes. It's a little bit quicker than the other activity that I shared earlier. This activity calls upon students to analyze embedded perspectives, themes, and messages about the past and current news. And so, for example, in this activity, students read various descriptions of Sally Hemings from different news sources and then discuss the ways in which these different descriptions of Sally Hemings carries different interpretations of her experiences as an enslaved woman. So, for example, here's one newspaper which referred to Sally Hemings as Jefferson's mistress and the mother of his children. And here's another news article that describes Sally Hemings as an enslaved woman and the, uh, the half-sister of his late wife. And a, another news source that identified Sally Hemings as a slave. Now, what do you think the differences are? Uh, or what would you want your students to understand about the differences uh, in referring to Sally Hemings as a slave, Sally Hemings as an enslaved woman, and Sally Hemings as Jefferson's mistress. What would you all want students to uh, understand or to talk about or to think about or to notice about these different descriptions? Well, to me, mistress implies consent and wanting to be a willing participant, basically, versus the enslaved or an enslaved woman implies that she had no consent. She had no say in what was happening. Exactly. So it's implying something different about their relationship. And in particular, right, um, as Tiffany pointed out, there's sort of different degrees by which we imagine a Sally Hemings as having control over her life based on the different words that are used to describe her. Now, um, historians nowadays typically refer to not slaves, but enslaved people, enslaved women or enslaved men, enslaved children. And we do this to emphasize that although these people were under the law property, they were still at base human. And so some scholars object to the terminology of referring to uh, enslaved people as slaves because it's accepting the master's perspective of their commodification, their um, their 
legal definition as property without recognizing their humanity. So scholars today refer to enslaved people rather than slaves. Uh, but um, also, as Tiffany mentioned, specifically with the Sally Hemming situation, there's a, a, a clear difference between referring to Sally Hemings as a mistress and an enslaved woman. And so here you see um, some of the ways in which this became controversial. There was there there have been a couple of instances in which uh, prominent um, talking heads within different news networks or prominent newspapers have referred to Sally Hemings as a mistress, as Thomas Jefferson's mistress. So this was a bit of a controversy uh, when the Washington Post, for example, referred to Jeff to Sally Hemings as Jefferson's mistress um, in one of their in one of their um, headlines, and they later changed the wording of their headline. Uh, and you see here uh, a criticism of the Washington Post perspective. And then here you see an article from Teen Vogue critiquing the use of the word mistress for Sally Hemings, um, precisely for the reasons that Tiffany identified. And so what I emphasize for students is that in many respects, the skills to become expert readers of historical news are the same skills to become expert readers of today's skills. So the, the, the slide that I showed of some of the skills to read primary sources, sourcing, analyzing, contextualizing, corroborating, interpreting, uh, these are all the same skills that students can use for uh, historical sources, primary sources from the past, newspapers from the past, but also can use um, for newspaper articles today as they're assessing the reliability of news sources. I'm going to turn it over to Megan. So I'm going to try to pick up where we, um, where Susanna left off by um, being able to kind of a um, couple of things. So first of all, um, I know that you had a series of discussions previously about media literacy with the other Megan, I believe her was her name as well. And um, so I kind of, I, some of this may be a little bit of a, um, repetition, but I just want to frame it in a little bit differently. So I look back at her um, notes and she talks about news literacy and some main concepts about informed citizens are essential to good government and free society, that citizens must take a more active role in becoming well informed and sharing accurate information, and it's important to be aware of one's biases. So I'm going to um, similar to what Susanna previously mentioned, I think that we're keep looping back over these key concepts as very important and essential um, for students, whether it comes to historical thinking skills, news literacy, or media literacy. And so that's where we are going to um, pick up here um, and, and try to also share a bit from what you saw uh, last uh, week when we were together. So again, just to reiterate, so Susanna brought us back to these key concepts or primary source skills of sourcing, analysis, contextualization, cooperation, interpretation. So we'll keep looping again to these. Um, the main point here that I want to bring to attention is the um, contemporary context in which we find ourselves. So if you would um, direct your um, browser to this link, I think it's, um, so it's go ncsu.edu media lit. I'll put that in your um, chat window as, as well. When you get to this link, um, I think I needed to do the HTTP. Um, if you would make a copy instead of writing directly on it, so you can download and make a copy for yourself. See if that opens it up for you. So if you just hold on to that for a minute, later on in the presentation, we'll use these, um, we'll come back to this, so. Okay, I, guess, so I don't know that we all have access okay. to that document. Uh oh, okay. Let me work on that, sorry. Okay, so if I showed you this newspaper article, um, it might be a little difficult to see the fine print, but the headline is 5,000 people dump shoes in front of Nike headquarters. 
Um, this, the smaller print, the subcaption is Nike has been making Americans really mad by hiring football washout Colin Kaepernick to be the face of Just Do It campaign. So if you were asked to um, talk about the legitimacy or credibility of this uh, news article, perhaps some of the language may stick out to you, um, perhaps the, uh, the way in which it's framed. However, multiple studies have also shown that when we're faced with information that contradicts our beliefs, the part of our brain that controls the ability reason, to reason tends to shut down. So you may have seen other headlines like this one about N Nike falls as critics fume on, on social media from Bloomberg or this one from CBS Bay Area or this one from the Washington Post. So when you're confronted with this type of, of news article, it's easy to sort of rely on um, make judgments about what's true and credible based on what, um, how this new information aligns with our prior beliefs. And to get to the bottom of this article, you'd have to flex some of your uh, digital forensic skills. So for example, what one thing you could do is look at where the source is coming from. You could also do a reverse image search by um, right clicking on the image. And if you did that, you'd find that this picture was actually picked up in a two th from a 2009 uh, newsletter that was really depicting a Nike, Nike recycling program. So misinformation and fake news. But why does this matter? And recently the News Literacy Project helped frame it for us. Today's students are facing the most challenging information landscape in history. Rumors, conspiracy theories, and false information compete for attention alongside facts, evidence, and truth. Young people are not being prepared to recognize the difference. This lack of news literacy is a threat to democracy. Education is the solution. Checkology, created by the nation's leaders for education, and with just a couple of clicks, you'll be on your way. Setting up a class is simple. So we know, and, and as they mentioned previously in, one, in your first um, presentation, that students are almost online constantly, and most have access to the internet via smartphones. Added to that, we know that most teens use social media platforms to get the majority of their news. So why is this problematic? There's been a lot of research that's been written, some better than others. I highly recommend this book, Popular, by Mitch Prinstein. And in this book, what he does is talk about the way in which social media really activates that part of the growing adolescent brain that is so cued into social rewards. So making them particularly susceptible to the, um, to the cycle of social media, to seeking attention and seeking validation online. Of course, too, because the adolescent brain is still developing, it's difficult for adolescents to detect bias, a bias of all kinds. They're so important for us with media literacy, whether it's explicit, outright bias, or a more implicit bias. Um, like for instance, what Susanna was referring to when the nuance of wording and the way in which things are framed. And then of course, confirmation bias, which is that subconscious tendency to seek to interpret information and other evidence in ways that affirm our existing beliefs. So you have this context of adolescents who are constantly online, and then add to that this contemporary context of fake news and misinformation. Of course, fake news entered the popular lexicon after the 2016 presidential election, and it was actually named word of the year. After the election, there was a real um, sort of uh, introspection about what had, what had occurred. Um, so for example here, these are the top five fake election stories by engagement. Our Dartmoor study suggested that one in four Americans visited a fake news site in the month leading up to the election. And so when we look at the most commented web content, what we see is that it's often divisive and scary and fake or misinformed. To add to the kind of confusion that we're facing, we have this continuum of fake news between outright hoaxes or misrepresentation. 
Um, so the question here is, are both in both ends of the spectrum, however, they're meant to deceive and to distort. This is from first draft and they um, take it even a little bit more nuanced to include satire and parody, um, misleading content and imposter content. So what are the implications of this? Take for example, this fake news article written by 23 year old Cameron Harris um, and he basically sort of played on the notion of a rigged election during the 2016 election and developed this fake news page that got a lot of likes and uh, quite a bit of traffic. In order to determine the extent to which this was real or fake, we'd have to um, drill down again and use the, our digital forensics. And what you do is you'd find that that picture, that image of the stolen ballot boxes actually was taken from an um, image in, in Sheldon Heath community outside of London. However, regardless of the, um, the accuracy of this, it spread far and wide and went viral. Um, so for example, I found a copy of it on an Auburn Tigers um, fan page. Um, perhaps the most dangerous example of this um, occurred actually um, in Texas. Um, so you may have heard of it. So here's two fake um, Facebook pages, the screenshot forum. And what you'll notice is that both of them were encouraged to organize, um, to join up at a rally at noon on May 22nd. Um, and what we know after the fact is that this, we, these were created by Russian linked accounts. So they weren't in our country, they were foreign actors, but they were able to um, convince Americans to align a, against each other in real time. So the potential for violence here is real um, and certainly very concerning. This was one of many of the um, examples that were part of the Senate intelligence briefings after the election when they're trying to figure out what exactly was the role of foreign influence and in fake news during the election. So what we have here is a situation in which fake news and misinformation is designed to amplify um, voices that might not otherwise be heard. So the way in which they go viral, so that example of that 23 year old's news story just spreads and also to polarize, right? So these are meant to be divisive. So why does it occur? Well, because there's money in it. And so there's also this industrialization aspect. We think of these services as free, but they are not free. We're paying for them with our attention. Whether it's makeup companies trying to convince you that you're ugly or sugar companies trying to convince you that you're hungry or Russians trying to convince you who to vote for, the interests of advertisers are not our interests. But what's incredible is that all of these services are so young. It's within recent memory that we can remember what life was like before the advent of these technologies. We may well be the last generation that will be able to remember what life was like before this technology and before this continuous partial attention. If we don't get this right now, future generations won't even know what they're missing. They won't even know what life was like when it was easier to keep your attention on one thing at a time. So if, if, so given that context of polarization, amplification, industrialization, here in the mix of it, we as social studies instructors are grappling with how do we bring many literacy into the social studies, especially if we think about the purpose of social studies as being designed to support democratic education, media literacy becomes a really essential skill. I think we're in a very, very dangerous moment. Election integrity. Legal voter suppression. Radical indifference. More tribalism. Foreign election interference. You don't have a natural cognitive defense against this stuff. There are incredibly motivated groups of people with a particular agenda and the social ecosystem has given them the tools to reach other people to spread that agenda. That can be anything from a terrorist organization reaching out to recruit, like we saw with ISIS, or 
the Internet Research Agency reaching out to exploit societal divisions like we saw in the 2016 election. As we saw in the 2016 election, governments are also increasingly figuring out we can actually use these social media platforms to manipulate public opinion to our own end, to spread disinformation, to spread propaganda, and to really gin up um, hatred sometimes against vulnerable populations or the political opposition or whatever it is. If you think about presidential campaigns from years past, they used TV and they used you know, radio and other media that was the same for every person who heard or saw those advertisements. But if you're thinking about how advertising works on Facebook or, or Twitter or, or other social media, they can actually customize that ad to very small groups of people who all have, say, the same personality type. And that enabled campaigns to manipulate very small segments of the, of the population to do very specific things, whether it was to vote for a particular candidate or to raise money or, or potentially even to not vote at all. These campaigns are so well executed, so well done. You don't have a natural cognitive defense against this stuff. You just are going to take what you see credulously, and particularly if it appeals to your biases, which it should if they're doing their job targeting the right people with the right content, you're going to be receptive to it. This is not a future society that is compatible with democracy, that is compatible with human freedom that is compatible with the most elemental sense of human agency. Democracy isn't simply the option to vote for candidate A or candidate B. It is being well informed about what the candidates actually stand for. That's what we're at, we're at risk of losing. Having outside parties interfere in our election is just a horrible thing. Voting is the most basic building block of democracy. And if we don't have that, what do we have? So at this point, I just want to pause and kind of check in with you all to reflect a bit on what we've heard in that video in this quote that at present we worry that democracy is threatened by the ease at which disinformation about civic issues is allowed to spread and flourish. Do you agree? Um, is that um, over dramatized? That was those were scenes from the um, film Social Dilemma. Why or why not? What do you recommend should be done? So you can feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself. I mean, this is something that, of course, the founding fathers uh, talked about as well, that a democracy or a republic rests on the virtue of the citizenry, right, and yeah. the degree to which they're educated and informed. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I think nice comment about the only issue with at present, because I think it's been an issue throughout history. Yeah, we have been taking a long, um, a long view of, of fake news. And so we'll continue to. So thank you. So just kind of leave you with that. I think that um, one of the things that strikes me is this, this feels like yet another huge issue that's laid down on the feet of teachers. Um, to address. And so, uh, whereas this is this large um, socio-political issue, um, and so we may begin to, um, in social studies, classes and courses integrate these things into the classroom. And we have seen with other um, projects like um, voter registration or um, and, and sort of mini voting, micro voting uh, simulations, for example, that there is some of kind of boomerang effect that it will, students will sometimes bring this home to their families. So um, hopefully we can get some traction here in this regard. So when we talk about media literacy skills, there's two, I kind of divide them into two different things, skills-based and content-based. So previously in our last session in, in what um, Susanna was leading us through are really content-based approaches to looking to the past, for example, to develop strategies that can be transferred to the contemporary context, looking at media as a cultural text, engaging in discourse analysis. Um, but there's also skills that um, you know, come along with news literacy. And I think some of these, again, were covered previously, but reading laterally, looking, doing a web search about the topic, 
visiting the About Us page to see who created the content, looking in particular for paid content. A lot of the research on um, news literacy suggests that students in particular are susceptible to paid content. They don't tend to see, um, to pay attention um, to that. Use the reverse image search and engage in other types of digital forensics. So you may find um, it helpful to look for heuristics or you may be using some of these already. This is one published by the museum called Escape in which they draw attention to the evidence, source, context, audience, purpose, and execution, kind of similar to that list that Susanna gave us about doing a nice job in analysis. The notion here is that what these heuristics do is create scaffolds for students that eventually we can take away and, and they can develop those skills on their own to um, engage in media literacy. So I um, had hoped, I think we have a, a little bit of time to at least do the first activity here. Um, so I'm going to pop this in the window. Um, this is also described in your, in that document that you downloaded. So here is a, a tweet from Jason Michael during Hurricane Harvey. I put the link to it as well. And so what I'd like you to do is to determine the credibility of this source to try a, a very easy technique of, um, of doing a reverse image search. So what you'll do is you'll open up that link and then you'll do, you'll hover on the image and just do a right click and go down to the bottom of your menu and you can search Google for the image. Tell me what you come up with. Somebody says they remember this image, yeah. What you'll see probably pretty quickly is this shark gets around. I think that it appeared in um, tweets, news stories, um, not legitimate news stories, but tweets from a lot of hurricanes actually in a variety of other, um, I think it originally came from an inspirational poster. And so again, this is an example of that sort of digital forensic and lateral read that may be very helpful to teach students. It's a very quick, um, and sort of easy way to look for the legitimacy and credibility of things. Now you may look at a tweet like this and say, is this that bad, he's being funny, but perhaps you know, there are real implications for this type of misinformation online. The other one I would recommend that you use with your students is this minimumwage.com website. Um, this is a really good example of um, asking students to engage in particular lateral reading when they um, when they go to the site and begin doing some of their, you ask them if it's a credible site or not. By doing some lateral reading, they'll figure out that this um, page was created by a lobbyist that represents the restaurant industry. And so they have to kind of read through that bias to understand the credibility of the source. So those are two just quick examples of um, ways that you can integrate media literacies into the classroom with your students. Um, I'd also be curious to hear more about your recommendations for engaging students. And perhaps we can hold that till the end when we have our, our Q and A. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to make sure I leave you with after last week's session, and last week in particular, we looked quite a bit at partisan newspapers from the era of the Civil War, kind of the emergence of the penny press in the United States. And I did want to be sure to acknowledge that there is a history of professionalization of news journalism. Here's a quote um, that kind of talks to um, an understanding at the end of the 19th century of the need to uh, professionalize news journalism. And so there, there's a, a book I reference here is the journalism 1908, Birth of the Profession. And basically the, the notion here is that they're tracing the sort of beginning of professionalization of news journalism with the opening of journalism schools, the beginning of the National Press Club, the emergence of the AP. So there's a variety of different places that you could kind of connect in your curriculum to, to help students understand the history of American journalism. Um, so for example, we talk about yellow journalism in schools um, when 
there was this shift maybe be between the partisan papers towards more ad revenue generating papers. Um, but certainly we could also, during the progressive era, talk about muckraking and investigative journalism. The um, Library of Congress collection is rich in resources for you to use with your students, um, particularly really nice images that are sometimes more accessible to our students. Um, you could also uh, talk about the history of the African-American press and such an important role it played um, throughout the history of the United States and um, in particular during the civil rights era as a way to um, also again trace the history of news journalism. Um, and then talking more about the professionalization of news journalism. So this is a, a a screenshot of a bust that um, from Columbia Journalism School, which is one of the first major journalism schools founded um, by Joseph Pulitzer. And so according to Winfield, this marked a real turning point in the field of journalism when it becomes officially established um, by formal university instruction um, and becomes kind of a career orientation. Or um, There's a lot of, um, comparison between opening journalism schools, just like medical schools, just like normal schools for teaching, et cetera, during the period of the... Um, of. And then finally, I think the important role of the press as the fourth estate throughout American history as that check on government, the way in which um, investigative journalists have you know, brought attention to injustices, to issues, um, perhaps crimes that have occurred and the important place of news journalism in our history and these great turning points in American history. And then finally, I think the encouragement is that all news journalism isn't the same and to encourage your students to look for standards and ethics pages on the sources that they consult for current events and for news. Um, the News um, Literacy Project has a really nice standards for quality journalism that students could look at and use, again, as a heuristic to kind of understand the extent to which the news that they're consuming, it meets these high quality standards. Um, I included here a screenshot. There's a nice um, also video created by Facing History and Ourselves that's in helpful for working with students that talks about how journalists minimize bias um, and do their best to, um, to tell the truth and, and to, um, to make sure they frame it in a way um, that takes into account well, perhaps multiple perspectives as needed while also still owning their positionality as reporters. So um, kind of in the, in the time we have remaining as we're thinking about our question and answer session, I wanted to leave you with these three questions. The first is, how can we address the contemporary context of fake news and misinformation in the social studies classroom? How can we meaningfully integrate the history of news journalism into social studies? And how can the analysis of news journalism from the past inform media literacy in the contemporary context? So I'm going to leave off with these questions um, so that we have plenty of time for conversation, discussion, and questions.